This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Bad news, it's not Friday. Hell, it's not even Thursday. Good news, you get to spend the next 30 minutes commiserating that revelation with me. Here's what we got for y'all. We'll break down just how rare it is to see a conviction like the one in the Derek Chauvin trial and all the factors it took to build that case against him. Then we'll get you caught up on the stage to screen adaptations, getting some buzz ahead of the Oscars. But first, here's what you need to know right now. The US is on pace to give 200 million COVID shots in President Joe Biden's first 100 days. When tomorrow's vaccine and vaccination numbers come out, we'll show that today we did it. Today we hit 200 million shots and the 92nd day in office. All Americans age 16 and older are now eligible to get a COVID vaccine, but there are still ongoing trials for younger kids. Experts also warn of a vaccine wall, which means despite a surplus of vaccines, the demand of those who want the shot is dropping. Maximizing the number of Americans who get vaccinated is a crucial goal for the White House. Biden previously outlined the 4th of July as the date to return to something closer to normalcy nationwide. As the administration tries to encourage its vaccination message, you might be seeing a lot more of these PSAs. Get a call from a friend to remind you that you're not alone. Then you know deep down inside it's gonna be Demonstrations started up in Columbus, Ohio after a black teenage girl was shot and killed by police. It happened minutes before the verdict in the Derek Chauvin case. Later that same day, police released a portion of the body camera footage. Normally we don't uh, provide information this soon, but we understand the public's need, desire, and expectation to have transparency upon what happened. Body camera footage appears to show 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant with a knife. She seems to charge at another girl, and that's when the officer shoots. A man on the scene can be heard saying, she's just a kid, after the officer fired his weapon. Police had been dispatched to Micaiah's foster home after a caller reported female suspects trying to stab them. According to some of Micaiah's family on the scene, Micaiah was the one who contacted the police. The Columbus Police Department has handed the shooting investigation over to a state-level office. Columbus Police have been involved in several high-profile shootings of black people in the past year. The officer who shot Andre Hill is facing trial for murder. Meanwhile, the death of Casey Goodson Jr. is still under federal investigation. This is only the beginning. That's the sentiment echoed by activists, protesters, and lawmakers across the country after former police officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all counts of the killing of George Floyd. So what's next? Today, the Department of Justice announced a probe into Minnesota's policing practices. The investigation will look into police training, policies, and how misconduct allegations are handled. The investigation will also assess whether the MPD engages in discriminatory conduct and whether its treatment of those with behavioral health disabilities is unlawful. The DOJ is already investigating whether Chauvin and the other officers involved violated Floyd's civil rights. In a press conference after Tuesday's verdict, Vice President Kamala Harris also called on Congress to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. A measure of justice isn't the same as equal justice. This verdict brings us a step closer, and the fact is, we still have work to do. We still must reform the system. The bill would change the standard to evaluate whether law enforcement use of force was reasonable to necessary. It also bans chokeholds at the federal level and bans no-knock warrants in drug cases at the federal level, among other things. The bill cleared the House last summer but died in the Senate. It's unclear if that will be taken up again. As for Chauvin, his sentencing is scheduled to come in two months, with his bail revoked in the meantime. Three other officers are facing charges in Floyd's death. The state will make its case against them in August. A guilty verdict like the one we saw yesterday surprised a lot of people, myself included. And that's because it's an especially rare kind of verdict. Here's what I mean by that. 
According to several places that collect this kind of data, police kill more than 1,000 people a year, whether justified or not. The majority of those are shootings. From 2013 to 2020, more than 98% of those police killings have not resulted in officers being charged with a crime. That's according to Mapping Police Violence. And of the number of people charged, only a small fraction of them are convicted. We can get even more specific though. Arrests from chokeholds and neck restraints, like the one we saw in this Chauvin case, are also pretty rare. That's according to new data we requested from Philip Stinson, a professor at Bowling Green State University who tracks police crime. Yo, stop talking to bro! Since 2005, 25 law enforcement officers have been arrested for those crimes and 12 have been convicted. Stinson says most of these cases don't result in death and four of those arrests came after the death of George Floyd. All of this information still presents an incomplete picture. We don't exactly know how many people are killed by police every year. One government source, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, suspended their collection of arrest-related death statistics, saying the methodology just wasn't reliable. There are myriad reasons why police officers aren't convicted more often, including legal protections like qualified immunity and the so-called blue wall of silence that discourages officers from speaking out about colleagues' misconduct. But Derek Chauvin's trial was different. The Minneapolis police chief testified against him. As President Biden put it Tuesday, there was a unique and extraordinary convergence of factors that led to this conviction. A video filmed by a woman who was 17 at the time of George Floyd's death, eyewitness testimony from people who saw it happen, including a girl who was nine years old at the time, the police chief testifying against Chauvin in court, and persistent protests across the world for the last year calling for justice for George Floyd. The takeaway here? In America, it takes a hell of a lot to hold a police officer accountable for killing somebody while on duty. And this time, there was just enough evidence for a jury to convict. During Chauvin's trial, there were three weeks worth of testimony, much of which focused on the minutes leading up to Floyd's death. One of the things that stood out to many people online was the gulf between the original police report and what was said in court. Newsy's Jamal Andrus explains how these discrepancies highlight the distrust some communities feel towards police departments. Guilty! Guilty! Derek Chauvin was found guilty for his actions, but as community members and onlookers reflect on the verdict, some can't help but consider how we got here. I wonder what would have happened if you know, we didn't all get on the ground, if we didn't organize for months, if buildings didn't burn down, if people didn't die in the process, you know what I mean? Like, what would have happened? Would we have ever gotten justice? And the answer is no. The viral video showing Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes provoked instant outrage. But the initial report paints a very different picture. Floyd physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and noted he appeared to be suffering from medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. At no time were weapons of any type used by anyone involved in this incident. This recounting of the incident, which makes no mention of Chauvin's actions, was circulated to the media before the undeniable truth went viral. Our clients have been telling us about this kind of behavior for decades. Mary Moriarty is the former chief public defender for Hennepin County. She tried cases in the very courtroom we've been watching the past few weeks. It was not surprising uh, to any of our staff that uh, police officers had lied in a report. Most recently in Chicago, 13-year-old Adam Toledo was shot and killed by a Chicago police officer. Police initially claimed Toledo was armed when the officer fired. In fact, the state's attorney even falsely told a judge that the teen had a gun in his hand. Body camera video later revealed he tossed the gun a second before the Chicago police officer opened fire. Breonna Taylor was shot eight times in her home after Louisville Metro Police raided her apartment with a no-knock warrant. 911, Operator Harris, where is your emergency? Somebody kicked in the door and shot my girlfriend. But the police report detailing the incident listed her injuries as none and claimed there was no forced entry during the incident. Louisville's mayor called the inaccurate report unacceptable, saying, quote, it's issues like this that erode public confidence in the LMPD's ability to do its job. Ahmaud Arbery was shot and killed after being chased down by two white men in rural Georgia. The police report from the responding officer relied entirely on the account of Gregory McMichael, described at the time as a witness, now charged with murder. One of the most notable instances of a police report cover-up came in 2015 
after dash cam video showing the shooting death of Laquan McDonald was released. An activist and an independent journalist filed suit against the city to get video of the shooting released. An inspector general report of the incident implicated 16 officers for filing false reports. And while Jason Van Dyke was found guilty of murder, the three officers accused of helping to cover up his crime were acquitted of any wrongdoing. It's the accountability for filing that report. And I don't see that. Make those officers accountable so that we can get those officers out of the department. Jamal Andrus, Newsy, Chicago. Okay, switching gears a bit. When you're back, we'll tell you what to look out for during this year's Oscar ceremony. Here's your daily reminder. The Oscars are this Sunday, and Newsy's Casey Mendoza has been doing her best this week to give y'all a cheat sheet so you can go in with some knowledge of what to expect. In this installment, She's telling us about which stage to screen adaptations are really getting some buzz. From Amadeus to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest to Moonlight, the Oscars love to celebrate play adaptations. And three of this year's biggest contenders made that same journey from stage to screen. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, One Night in Miami, and The Father. I saw Ma Rainey in the mid 80s and uh, was blown away. I'm gonna get me a band and make me some records. Telling the story of the mother of the blues, Gertrude Ma Rainey, and the exploitation of black artists in the 1920s, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is the second adaptation of August Wilson's plays from actor and producer Denzel Washington. The original stage production earned three Tony nominations in 1985, including a nomination for Best Play. Tony award-winning actor and writer Ruben Santiago Hudson took the helm of the film adaptation. He knew that it needed to, as they say, open up the world um, from stage to screen. He took um, great strides to trim it down, truncate some of the language, but still give us enough so you had enough to build on. I wanted to get people who understood the theater and how it works and, and have had success at it and know what a play is and obviously what a film is and how to, to, to blend those two. Well, maybe you fellas just like going around with targets on your backs. Oh, we learn from the best, Brother Minister. Telling the story of civil rights icons Malcolm X, Jim Brown, Sam Cooke, and Muhammad Ali, One Night in Miami originally debuted in 2013 as a dialogue-heavy play that took place entirely in one room. The film was written and adapted by Kemp Powers and directed by Regina King in her feature directorial debut. Reading it, Kemp Powers, his, his words, his, the dialogue just punch me in the gut. Nominated for the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, Powers and King have spoken on the importance of opening up the play to the world, making it less intimate than the original source material, but still finding ways to focus on the conversations and debates between the four main characters. A lot of that came from just having a great quartet of, of actors where they truly understood um, that they were brothers. I don't need any help from anyone. Also nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay is The Father, an exploration of dementia by Florian Zeller. The French playwright told the New York Times that the film allowed the story to be more immersive and better convey the disorientation faced by the main character. There's something funny going on. Casey Mendoza, Newsy, Chicago. In a rare team-up, politicians and fans took on several European soccer teams after their announcement to start an exclusive Super League. Now that those plans have turned to rubbish, calls for ownership reform have only gotten louder. Our bruv Luke Hanrahan brings us the latest from London. Fans furious at their owners as six English football clubs, or should that be soccer clubs, chose to found the European Super League, a separate exclusive league for 15 self-appointed super clubs. If the fans aren't behind it, then I will honestly boycott the matches. No one's going to watch them. It's over for them. 
This protest, the culmination of 48 hours of a pressure so intense, all of the English and Italian clubs backed out. Here, Chelsea fans react to that news in real time. Well, it would have wrecked everything. It would have wrecked English football, it would have wrecked the Premier League, it would have wrecked our experience as Chelsea fans. A turbulent two days that left a plan many saw as a greedy money-grabbing exercise in tatters. Each of the would-be members was promised $425 million to sign up. We were disgusted by it. And the one thing we've always been able to hold on to is that we're a classy club. And then now, with one stroke, the owner of the club, was just removing that as well. And I, I just think that the fans have said enough is enough and we're not going to tolerate this. A breakaway league that Prince William and the Prime Minister vocally opposed. Be in no doubt that we don't uh, support it and uh, support the creation of this European Super League. I think it's uh, not in the interests of, uh, of fans. It's not in the interests of, of football. Well, it was certainly an attempted power grab by a clutch of billionaires. For John Burko, a passionate Arsenal fan who led the House of Commons for over a decade, the attempted power grab proves the Premier League needs to reform. The real issue I think that is now left for our football here is whether the future, how do we regulate football? Is it right that single individuals with vast resources should be able to direct a club in one direction without any consultation with or support from or in some cases even the knowledge of the people at that club. It was a perceived lack of competition that would see none of the founding teams relegated, drawing similarity to professional American sports leagues that many found so objectionable. Liverpool's owner John W. Henry has now apologised. Over these 48 hours you were very clear that it would not stand. We heard you. I heard you. The end, but perhaps the beginning of a new chapter in European football. For Newsy, I'm Luke Hanrahan in London. Sad day for all the European vendors getting ready to press their Soccer Avengers t-shirts. Aside from dealing with the whole global pandemic last year, the US also recorded the most billion dollar disasters ever. In total, there were 22 separate climate disasters in 2020, like wildfires and hurricanes, which cost more than a billion dollars each. As a part of our Earth Week coverage, we're gonna hear from experts who explain the connection between these events and climate change. What we've seen over the last several years are rising trends in different types of extremes in different parts of the countries. I'm Adam Smith. I'm an applied climatologist with NOAA, and I study the interface between extreme events, risk, costs, and the science about all of these events. Since 1980, the United States has found that we've been impacted by 285 of these billion dollar weather or climate disaster events. And the total cost for these 285 events approached $2 trillion in 2020 dollars. The reason that these disasters are increasing in cost and frequency are for three reasons that intersect. One is exposure. We have more people and more assets in harm's way. Two, we have more, more vulnerability, um, where we build, how we build. Uh, again, we saw that in Texas. And three, of course, climate change. Climate change is playing an increasing role in the increasing frequency of some of these extremes that lead to billion dollar disasters. You know, climate change is the fact that we have emissions in the atmosphere that are changing weather patterns, right? It's expected to be one of the major costs of uh, climate change. And what we've seen so far, where last year you had seven billion dollar hurricanes that happened in just one year, right? Uh, and some of them were actually costs that were quite far above uh, one billion dollars. During the 80s, 1980s and 1990s decade, we would see maybe half a dozen events per year. And in the 2000s, it started to ramp up. In fact, in the last three years, we've had 50 separate billion dollar weather and climate disaster events. More specifically in 2020, it was a record year. We had 22 separate weather or climate disasters that each cost a billion dollars or more. The previous annual record was 16 events. If you think of uh, the damages of climate change as a whole in the U.S., like estimates range quite broadly, somewhere between 0.5 and 
4% of GDP. So if we take like 2% as a kind of like median number, this is equivalent to the growth of the economy annually, right? So we're basically saying the cost of climate change is going to be how much we grow every year, right? Like it's going to cancel out completely. And so we're not going to be able to grow anymore. <laughs> Part of my job as a scientist is to understand all the characteristics about the hazards we deal with with severe weather. I'm the lead research meteorologist at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. We test building products in their small scale using very meticulous tests. And our goal was really to mimic the effects of severe weather the best we can in a lab environment to show what we can do, where buildings are struggling, where they're doing well, and what are the steps to really uh, take a bite out of all this damage that we see year after year. As we look as our climate changes, it's so critical that we adapt now to the weather we face because we know it's just going to get worse in the future. We need to think about how to design a better future and have a better future for the next generation. The cold wave winter storm event that really impacted Texas and even other states around Texas um, will likely be the most costly winter storm on record for the United States, almost certainly. Uh, we don't really have data for that yet, but that's gonna be really, really impactful. And part of that was, again, the, um, the energy infrastructure wasn't ready for such a cold blast, a cold wave, which Texas has had before. You basically started with a significant Arctic cold outbreak um, for you know somebody who lives in the South. You know, we don't necessarily look to design our structures to withstand the cold that you would see in, say, Minnesota. Um, but we had a prolonged cold spell. You know, when faced with these constraints, humans adapt, right? Um, and so I find that to be kind of a positive. The, the problem is that it tends to happen only when you're faced with extreme circumstances, when really we should be adapting right now and reducing our consumption of pretty much everything. It's almost like we're saying every year is a historic year. We're running out of adjectives. I don't think that uh, these trends will slow down anytime soon. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Go ahead and get those tweets off. You'll feel better about it, and it'll give me something to brag about to my niece in a few years when she can finally understand Twitter and a whole bunch of other things. Protesters in Russia have been demonstrating to show their support for Alexei Navalny, an imprisoned opposition leader and Russian President Vladimir Putin's biggest rival. Navalny is reportedly in failing health because of an ongoing hunger strike. Russian police arrested more than 180 people in the demonstrations Wednesday. Newsy Sasha Ingber spoke to Navalny's economic advisor and tells us how Putin's influence is also affecting people within Navalny's inner circle. These days, Alexei Navalny, imprisoned and on a hunger strike, isn't the only Russian opposition politician struggling under President Vladimir Putin. We have communicated that there will be consequences if Mr. Navalny dies. Navalny's economic advisor, Vladimir Milov, fled Russia last month after seeing colleagues get arrested, placed under house arrest, or put under criminal investigation. I narrowly escaped arrest myself because a lot of police were actually waiting for, uh, for me at my doorstep. Same as with others. Uh, I was simply warned because I have a lot of supporters who live uh, in the same building. Milov tells Newsy he's facing multiple libel lawsuits filed by Putin's so-called chef, Yevgeny Prigozhin. If the name sounds familiar, that's because the U.S. sanctioned Prigozhin for financing the Russian troll farm that influenced U.S. elections. And new sanctions were imposed on him just days ago. That's about, uh, I don't know, like $300,000 altogether. I don't have that money and I actually don't want to pay him a single penny given who he is. Another blow. Last week, the Russian government started trying to dismantle Navalny's network, seeking to designate three groups as extremists. That includes the Anti-Corruption Foundation, which reported on Putin's billion-dollar personal palace. That could lead to criminal cases, penalties, and frozen finances. And the organization says the case has been classified as a state secret. Moscow's repression isn't new to Milov. He used to work with another prominent Putin foe who was assassinated near the Kremlin in 2015. But Milov doesn't feel safe. 
even outside Russia. We cannot feel uh, completely safe uh, when we saw many examples that uh, Putin's thugs uh, can actually reach people all across the globe, but we're not giving up the fight regardless. Now in Lithuania, he plans to provide officials with evidence of how oligarchs in Putin's circle have contributed to corruption and a human rights crackdown. This is really reminiscent of Stalin period uh, with, with real mass repressions, with reports like over 12,000 uh, people have been detained at mass rallies just within a couple of weeks. And this opposition movement uh, that has emerged in Russia in the past few years is unprecedented. This will not stop us from doing what we do. From Washington, Sasha Ingber, Newsy. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow for Earth Day in the loop style. Same time, same place, a little greener. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.